All right. Hello and welcome everybody to today's six door office hours, which is the six door meeting uh, intended uh, for users and people trying to adopt six door. So um, we don't have any demo. Oh, no, we do have a demo. Yeah, never mind. Uh, yeah, Zach, I think that's you. We have. It was uh, added extremely last minute, as in since perfect. the last time you said we didn't have any demos. So. Uh, amazing. Yeah, no, that's a good thing to cover. Uh, yeah, so we'll be looking at uh, the zero knowledge six door uh, and the, the paper and approach uh, that Zach and a few others have been working on. Uh, just before that, I wanted to just highlight a recent, we have a new case study on Sigstore, which is from Max Verman of Small Step. Uh, yeah, so really great to have the folks at Small Step just talk about um, how they came across Sigstore and Cosine specifically, how they're using it. And yeah, I think they, they connected into the, the future they're seeing, which is, you know, Keyless signing with Sigstore and also um, the tie-ins with passwordless. passwordless. So encourage folks to check that out if you haven't seen it and also help us promote it um, far and wide. Okay, so I will, in a minute, I'll pass over to Zach to cover uh, Speranza, but I'll also add that after that, we have a section for intro. So anyone who wants to say hi, please do so. And then we can drop into Q&A or any other business, any any questions about six or any discussion points folks want to bring up, um, this is a good place to do it. Okay, but with that, I will hand over to you, Zach. So yeah. take it away. Oh, uh, sorry, we can't hear you, Zach. I'm gonna uh, steal the screen if that's all righty. Go for it. Um, cool. So uh, this is, I would say, kind of a demo. Uh, I'm not going to show you any any flashy running code. Uh, I I could, but I think just walking you through how it how it works is is uh, just as good. Um, but this is something I've I've been um, publicizing within like the research channel in the Sig Store world. Um, it's a new paper that I, I wrote with um, a student and then a couple. Um, professors who are kind of interested in the software supply chain security space, including um, Santiago, who sits on the SIGSTOR TSC. Um, what is this about is basically a follow-up on some of the work that I've, I've been doing on privacy in SIGSTOR. Um, so what's the problem with that? Um, you know, okay, we say, well, GPG kind of sucks. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if you could have developers sign with their email addresses, which is much more usable in a lot of cases, um, but does have the uh, downside of requiring you to know the email addresses of the people who are doing the signing. Um, in some cases, this is totally fine. In others, you get a little bit bit antsy, right? You, you start to worry about, okay, what if what if I have privacy concerns? What if I don't want my email to be to be public? Um, and in fact, uh, the Rust world um, had a recent RFC for the crates package manager where they basically said, let's take emails all together out of package metadata um, to basically say, let's not give anyone an avenue to figure out who is publishing packages after they had a pretty unfortunate incident um, where somebody was started getting harassed uh, based on like packages, it, they had, which like in an ideal world, none of this would be a problem, right? We could let open source package maintainers just provide packages and not like try to figure out where they lived. Um, but uh, sadly, uh, that's not the world we live in. Um, and so uh, many package repositories who are some of the folks who want to be adopting SigStore have noticed that one of the big concerns that they have is in general, like privacy and like anything that uh, moves in the direction of requiring more emails in more public places, especially in like a transparency setting where these emails are now public, um, winds up being um, a little bit scary. And so I'm going to pop over to this is an RFC for Rust, nothing to do with signing, but basically, hey, let's let's take authors field out of uh, uh, Rust package metadata. Um, 
so uh, there's a bunch of, of possible things we can do uh, on on this front. Uh, and I will, uh, there's a blog post on the SIG store blog that I wrote uh, basically a year ago um, on privacy in SIG store. Um, and uh, you can read it at your leisure. Uh, but one of the one of the interesting tricks that that sort of comes up here is like the idea of using a pseudonym. Um, and so uh, a really lazy way to solve this problem is say, hey, if anybody anticipates they're ever going to be concerned about privacy at any point in the future, you should just not use your real name or real email address. Um, and there's a couple of problems here. One is introducing like a new identity for people to manage is kind of the opposite of of uh, what we were trying to do here, right? We were trying to consolidate uh, things to manage, put all your eggs in one basket and watch that basket, as opposed to saying, hey, now you have a new account you have to you have to keep um, track of. Um, the, other, the other issue is that you don't always know in advance whether you're ever at any point in your life going to care about privacy. If you become a public figure at some point in the future, oh, boom, you accidentally gave away your personal email address. Um, and that, that kind of sucks. Um, so there's another trick that's possible in OpenID Connect called pairwise pseudonymous identifiers. And what these are are basically pseudonyms that are drawn for each use or each like audience of the this is so this is a feature of OpenID Connect. So if I was going to log into Sigstore with my, you know, Gmail account, basically instead of Gmail giving me an identity token that says zach at gmail.com it would give me a random looking identifier that said, you know, that was somehow tied to Zach at gmail.com. So I get something opaque, but it's consistent. Every time I log in, I'm gonna get the, the same identifier. Uh, and this is gonna be di a different pseudonym for SigStore as for like, I don't know, Instagram, if I'm logging in with my Gmail account to Instagram. Um, it's, it's a distinct pseudonym based on the audience. Um, and so this, this actually kind of works. Um, there's a couple of problems. One is all of your SigStore metadata gets linked together. So you have one pseudonym for all the SigStore uh, ecosystem. The other problem is nobody actually implements this thing. Uh, you can't have Gmail issue you one of these. You could have like um, one, one of these um, paid uh, OpenID Connect identity providers if you're using them for, open S or for SSO within your organization. Uh, you can have them go ahead and uh, do PPIDs, but but like none of the big providers that SigStore uses um, allow it. I have a, a neat trick I proposed, uh, mostly because of the pun. I want to make a service called Oh, I didn't see you there, uh, which would be a an anonymizing proxy basically for OIDC. And we actually kind of run one of these already in SigStore. We we have um, as part of Fullcio, there's a service called Dex. We could basically make SigStore do PPIDs for you. Um, but again, there's the same problem of like, oh, you you actually wind up with the same pseudonym over and over again, which leads to sort of metadata concerns and, and linkages there. I don't know that that's the end of the world. I, I'd be pretty comfortable with, a, with an approach that was based on drawing a consistent automated pseudonym for users. Um, and in fact, that's one of the things that has been proposed in the Rust world in discussion about adopting SigStore. Um, in particular, they want to use a neat cryptographic tool called a verifiable random function to basically make auditable pseudonyms, right? In, in SigStore, we're always trying to make sure that the behavior of uh, powerful parties like Fulcio is something we can we can like double check on um, and monitor. Um, and the way a VRF works is basically Fulcio is going to be able to prove to someone that, yes, this is the consistent pseudonym for Zach at gmail.com. Um, you know, I, it's not going to be able to, to equivocate for me there. So the idea is that then I would draw a pseudonym. I wouldn't reveal to everyone what my email address was, but I could selectively real, reveal maybe to the PyPI repository, the NPM repository, what my underlying email address is. They'll link it back to the pseudonym. And then to everybody else, to consumers who are downloading my software, they just know that NumPy is owned by my consistent Stig, SigStore pseudonym. Um, but this work, uh, which you can go ahead and read at your leisure, it's a little wonky and we're hoping to have, I'm hoping to have some better, uh, less academic explanation soon. Uh, but the, the, the general trick here is that I'm gonna draw a new pseudonym every time. 
uh, I sign something with SigStore. So SigStore is going to issue me a cert with like one random string today and another random string tomorrow. And then these strings aren't actually random. They have some uh, cryptographic structure to them that lets me selectively link that link pairs of these together. Um, so if I draw a pseudonym today and a pseudonym tomorrow and a pseudonym again the day after that for a new cert, any two that I want to prove to someone were signed by the same underlying identity, I can go ahead and prove that. Um, and that's because the pseudonyms aren't random strings. They're like a, some crypto nonsense uh, and happy to go offline into, into details of that with anyone else. It's also in the paper, uh, but it's crypto nonsense that supports this idea that I, the signer, I know my identity. I can basically reveal the link between pseudonym today and pseudonym tomorrow, but pseudonym from Thursday is going to be totally distinct. Um, so um, this is uh, pretty fast. Uh, it's a couple hundred microseconds, which is you know within you know factor of five of what you're paying to do signing and verification anyway. So it's a little bit slower, but like network overheads are way way bigger than that for for doing a package upload. I think it's I think it's quite reasonable overall. Um, it's a little bit more work to deploy than like a system where we just track NumPy, Zach, uh, and now I have to track NumPy pseudonym. Um, but but overall, um, like I have a proof of concept uh, implementation in Fullcio. The changes to Fullcio are like uh, one line. Uh, that's that's not quite true, but it's uh, I'll I'll pull those up right now. Um, it's basically, I add one dependency, um, there's a hundred lines of crypto, um, and then the actual change to full CO itself is basically like these five lines. I, um, I, uh, pull out the email address and then instead of sticking the email address directly in there, I put what's called a commitment to the email address in there. So pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, if we actually did this, we'd want to do a little bit more testing and, and be a little bit more clever about how we embed these things in the certificate. Um, but but this will this will play for sure. Um, yeah. So I mean, that's that's the trick. Um, sorry, it's oh, uh, there is one final, somewhat kind of fun thing, which is uh, this is um, when you print out the cert. This is now what it looks like. Uh, I made a fake email address that ends with the string at peterson.commitment because the cryptographic trick we're using is called Peterson commitments. Again, in practice, you would want to do something better here um, and use it. Don't call this an email, call it as something else. Um, but this is basically embedded into the certificate um, as as normal. Um, so so nice, nice and easy. Um, there's some disadvantages. Uh, it totally ruins monitoring. I think this is a pretty fundamental thing uh, where basically if you have a fresh pseudonym every time, then by definition, you kind of lose the ability to go back and scan for every instance of your email address. Um, and having a consistent pseudonym, actually this kind of works because you have the same pseudonym every time. So you can just figure out what that pseudonym is. Uh, and then go scan the log for all uses of your single pseudonym. Uh, if the uh, if the pseudonyms are distinct, uh, this becomes a lot harder to do. And I don't think there's really a way around that. I think that's kind of a fundamental, you know, metadata problem. Um, yeah. So um, happy happy to take questions. I'm hoping to have a blog po post up at some point that goes through this. Um, in a little bit less wonky detail, that's going to have pretty pictures and and so on. Um, I'm hope so. I've I've shared this kind of with the Rust community. They seem intrigued. I don't know that they're uh, ready to to roll it out tomorrow, uh, but they seem at, at least interested. So um, I would be super excited if if something like this wound up getting uh, rolled out. I think uh, other approaches that have been proposed, like the VRF one, are also totally reasonable too. But if if that happens, if the Rust folks say, "Hey, this meets our our privacy needs," then I'll start the conversation in the six star community about changes to full CEO required and see if we're okay with the the monitoring story there and and how it degrades and and so on. Um, yeah, that's kind of the gist. So happy happy to take questions. Yeah, um, I, I was just, just purely on the format level. We do have support for other names in in the SAN, so you yes. can just do like another name extension uh, for the Peterson commitment string. Um, yeah, I, I think this looks really cool. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think I think that's. Um, 
what you would actually want to do. Uh, and there's a number of uh, there's a number of little things that are related to how you want to do this. Um, one thing I considered even was implementing it instead of doing it inside of full CO. So where you're packing the cert, uh, I considered doing it inside of Dex. Um, so the the um, plain text email never actually even gets to the full CO instance. Uh, I think there there are pros and cons, and would love to to discuss yeah. that. I would um, love to be in a position where that matters enough that I I think it's worth discussing which one we want to do. Yeah, well, one thing I wanted to get your your thoughts on is like so so one of the things I brought up in that RFC thread with the Rust Lang people is uh, whether it makes sense to, to do what NPM did and, and rather than uh, push people towards email identities to push them towards GitHub identities with the operating theory being it, unfortunately because of how source like you know, emails make sense you want to hide emails. You don't ever want to hide the source repository identifier because open source requires that you always have the source repository identifier. Uh, and if we if we push people in that direction of saying, uh, for 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 rustling purposes, because everybody's using GitHub anyways, if if you only ever sign with GitHub machine identities, uh, then you you avoid this entire problem because there's nothing else. Um, yeah, I and mean, that's very much like, I'm, as you know, that's very much like what's going on in NPM. And I think that's the reason that the NPM deployment has gone as smoothly as it has, yeah. is because they've been able to totally sidestep all these privacy issues, all these identity issues. Um, my answer is that if I get to like kind of live in a cave and, and cook up, um, you know, my dream for the world and impose it on the world, uh, I would have both. I, I would sort of say, okay, like, really what you want is some combination of the package has some maybe pseudonymous author and that author signs off on the source of every release and then github builds from the source to the published version of that package uh that's what goes on crates and there's kind of a build provenance attestation uh and then the client's going to wind up verifying basically both of these things that that you know kind of okay the 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 release came from the human identity that's associated with it and the build came from the repository I expect, and the build recipe that I expect as as well. Um, that's that's kind of my like, no resource limitations, no time limitations. Like I can build whatever I want scenario. I think there is a really compelling argument in terms of getting something deployed uh, for doing something like what npm has done in general. Um, and I think if you know, hey, if that lets us sidestep. You know, you know, basically bring in signatures. Um, I'm all for it. Yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah. The reason I bring it up is, is so you know, for the PyPI case, the question is that like, we we want to start sort of support for six four pretty soon, and so as a matter of expedience, I think for like the MVP, it might make sense to limit it to GitHub machine identities because um, this does. So there's other lead, like just just for general privacy reasons, it makes sense to keep that the amount of of PII on PyPI to the to a minimum, and machine identities also satisfy that constraint. Absolutely. Though I will note that you know some people host repositories under their GitHub usernames, which could be their full names. Which yes, yeah, yeah. I, and that's why I say like these things. It's not actually a solution. It's it's purely a it's like a force. It's it's a force solution because you have to have a GitHub repository uh, to be part of the open source or not not GitHub, but you have to have a source repository. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, I guess I guess what I worry about is a world where like there's a tension between the ability to redact. You know, I. For whatever reason, want to file my GDPR request or eradicate all traces of my name from the internet. Um, Ten years down the line, I, will, I am always going to be looking for something where if I do that everywhere uh, that my name ever appears, it doesn't wind up causing kind of a denial of service. Um, and so I think you know there's some story in the middle where okay, we we elaborate a little bit more on redaction, right? Like this idea that like okay. Um, and, the, and there's, um, a, I think, a proposal I've heard uh, Hayden talk about, um, which, which uh, I don't know how if if that's written up or, or shared anywhere, but but he's at least speculated on this idea that one thing we could do like tomorrow is to just stick instead of the subject be my name, it would be hash of my name, which isn't perfect by any means. It's it's sort of brute forceable, but. Um, but at least it it gets the thing that's in the transparency log. It gets the PII out of the transparency log itself. Uh, and then all I don't know. We need to figure out. Um, I need to find like a lawyer who's well versed in both GDPR and cryptography to ask all my questions about. Well, is a hash of an IP address PII uh, is you know a an opaque string PII if there's a published link between that opaque string and my name. Um, 
what if that what if that link is hosted somewhere else like all of these things i think were were not specified in the in the uh, text of the gdpr uh and and so yeah not to take us on a whole tangent but yeah i have a lot of questions <laughs> yeah yeah well and my, my my general hope is it seems like the intent of that sort of legislation and i'll put on my obligatory i'm not a lawyer i'm not your lawyer uh uh the lakes foundation does have lawyers so if you have real questions talk to them um and they they're happy to advise on things for stuff but uh the impression i get is that the eu is not interested in going after like open source foundations running software transparency projects uh really like the uh, sig store doesn't really feel like a priority for an enforcement for them uh which doesn't mean we shouldn't be mindful of privacy and shouldn't plan for the future uh but at the same time i think eh, when we have to make pretty reasonable compromises i'm comfortable just going with my gut and saying yep that does in fact sound reasonable I got a couple of questions sure. um, on how it manifests. So is it a, um, so if you use this system, is it kind of all or nothing? So everyone is anonymized or they're not, but there's no like per user decision to be made? Uh, I would probably, especially for backwards compatibility reasons, stick an extra flag in the Fulcio API, where basically when you request a certificate from Fulcio, you say, I would or would not like this to be anonymized. So you could get the old fashioned cert that still says, you know, Tracy at gmail.com. Uh, but but if you prefer the private solution and um, we could build a preference for that into signing tools for a package repository, for instance, when you're running pip publish or npm publish, um, you know, we could request the, the private certs. But there's no reason that you wouldn't be able to have both at the at the same time. Great. And a second question, like you showed that snippet with the, the PDSN that committed, is it the case that the domain is not anonymized then? Or no, the the that's a made up domain. That's not a that's not a real domain. That's just meant to indicate the thing before the at sign in this email address shouldn't be interpreted as an email address. It should be interpreted as um some crypto magic um and an opaque identifier that you're then going to think about um uh this is kind of what william was was saying for and when he was asking questions about formats really what you want to do is x509 certs have basically typed data fields um mm -hmm. and so really what you want to do is to have a like type uh like instead of it saying this is an email address and then i make a fake email address in a way to embed big numbers into an email address, even though they're not email addresses at all. Yeah, I would say, oh, the the X5, the subject of this X509 cert is a my arbitrary extension Peterson commitment or something like that. Okay, um, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. No, that yeah, that was just doing the literal laziest thing I could to, to get this value into a into a cert and it'll work for a demo. Um, in, in the long run. Um, yeah, you, you definitely want to roll it out slightly differently. And that's like an extra you know, a couple like tens of lines of code. It's not like now it becomes a huge engineering project, but there's a number of decisions that you'd want to, I mean, like anything, the gap between kind of like the laziest prototype you could possibly implement and something you're ready to deploy to the world is there's a little bit of a gap. It, it's also already specified in the OID spec we have somewhere. Like we have a OID other name set for um, service uh, identities. Cool. Okay, yeah, I understand. All right. Yeah, that's all I had. All right. Um, cool. Well, thanks for letting me yak. Um, I I think some of these is uh, pretty exciting, and I'm I'm hopeful that um, whether or not it, it actually gets adopted, it can kind of um, move along along with uh, some of like Will's suggestions about you know alternative ways of getting signing going going in Rust. Uh, I think you know uh, NPM the work that's going on there is really awesome. Uh, I think we need maybe one more domino down before I feel like there's enough momentum to that we're going to really start seeing, or maybe two more dominoes down before there's enough momentum that I think we're going to see SIG store signatures rolling out widely across OSS ecosystems. Uh, and I'm hopeful that, you know, eh, we can we can at least make make all these folks who have legitimate concerns about about these sorts of things. Uh, we can we can demonstrate to them that we're thinking about them as well, and uh, there's a plan, and, and maybe make them comfortable with with at least trying some of the stuff out. Uh, but happy to take questions uh, in the Slack or whatever. Um, shoot me an email, find me in Slack. Uh, 
and would love to talk to you off about any of the crypto magic or uh, there's a bunch of other uh, tricks in there that uh, didn't come up in this call that are, are kind of informed by recent work in uh, so-called key transparency um, that we threw in uh, mostly for fun. Uh, but that's, that's for another time and date. <laughs> Great. Any further questions, comments for Zach? Okay. Thanks, Zach. And yeah, you heard how to follow up uh, on anything you've heard today. All right, let's switch to intros. Uh, this is a section if anybody new or returning wants to say hi, introduce themselves, and maybe say what brought them to this meeting and if they want to share more on what they're looking to get out of the community. Uh, this is your chance. So any intros, just go ahead, raise your hand, or just start speaking. I'll give it a few more seconds if you're looking for the unmute button. OK, no intros today. Uh, Q and A. Any questions or discussion points anyone wants to raise? Just bring up that now is a great time. If you have like literally any question about Six Door, could be about deploying it, could be about using it, could be about design. Um, but you have a bunch of folks in the room who know a fair bit about it and would love to love to chat. If you're curious, there's nothing that's really off topic. Actually, I might ask a question while folks are thinking about it, um, especially since we have William here and just based on the Speranza paper, it raised a, a lot of things that reminded me about the whole verification flow. And I know folks are doing a lot to sign stuff. And I was just curious where things are at with verification and maybe taking Python community as one, one of the most advanced. Like, what's, this, what's the story with verification today? Yeah, so so the story is that there is no story for verification itself for Python. Um, I one of the things that I'm tasked with with the current work we have funded is to write up a like a policy document for what I think verification could look like for packaging ecosystems like like PyPI and and um, and, and crates. Um, so the the current thing that we're we have, we have I currently have like two ideas that, that I'm working on. One is a top based uh, scheme in which. Uh, so, so both these schemes are, 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 are first, to, first use tofu style schemes. In, in the first scheme, you have PyPI accounts, and when you upload your first ever PyPI, your, your first ever six, six four signature to the index, it basically gets tofu into uh, a tough repository somewhere. And tough and tough serves as this auditable uh, repository of, of, of identity lookups. And so every time you download a package, you can say, well, does the identity signing for this package match the one that's supposed to be in tough? And if not, uh, this, this this identity isn't isn't uh, authorized to sign for this this package. Um, that, that that's one possibility. Um, the other possibility is to reintroduce some degree of trust in PyPI itself and have PyPI simply say uh, the email address or the GitHub URL that is in the metadata for this package is the trusted identity for these signatures. And in this context, PyPI is a trusted entity. Uh, Compromises of PyPI could of course rewrite that metadata, uh, but at the same time. It's much easier to do than rolling out top. We, we, we've had issues in the past with rolling out top at, at, at PyPI scale. Um, so um, that's that's like a, a potential stopgap. Like that, that could be a first step because it doesn't actually preclude a larger rollout inside of top. OK. Yeah, no, that's useful. And then I guess outside and maybe just outside of PyPI, like would we ever envision a world where I guess some of the verification might happen in other entities like Cloud providers and things like that built in is. is... Oh yeah, so, so you mean like a client side, side yeah. uh, verif signature verification? Yeah, I mean, so for th that's just I think it's just a matter of the six core clients uh, being deployed in enough places. Uh, like six core Python is ready for that. You can you can use it today to do signature verifications. It's just a matter of uh, getting people to actually do that. Okay. Um, yeah, for, 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 again, for just because I know Python the best, Python specifically, the issue is that, um, pip install, pip has to run on every platform that Python supports. And what that means is that every dependency of pip has to, has to run on every platform that, that, uh, uh, Python supports. 
And that include, that would include the six door client and the six door client and currently includes Rust cryptography, which definitely does not run on every platform that Python supports uh, intentionally and, and, and it never will. So. I think, I, I think I cut out there for a second. Yeah, we just, uh, yeah. But, but you get the gist. Basically, like there's this there's this gap that has to be cleared uh, around. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll, I'll plug some of the, some of the work that's happening in the SIG clients uh, group is basically aimed at this problem. Is is how can we make sure we have a consistent verification experience uh, in a bunch of different ecosystems. Uh, and especially, can we do that without requiring uh, a heroic level of effort like uh, the ones that the, have been put into making the six door Python client, uh, which is beautiful, but it took a lot of work. Uh, and, and so can we have sort of verification of similar quality uh, with a whole lot less work uh, in a new language? Like if someone wants to do this in C and Java and, and you know, Haskell even. Um, and, and so we're trying to do, yeah, two things. So one is let's lower the lift to make a new client in a new language. Uh, and there's a couple of proposals for that. Uh, one of them is to sort of um, use a shared library, um, something like in the Rust that wouldn't work in uh, for reasons that William just pointed out um, in, in the context of, of PyPI, but at least it reduces the total number of applications. The other thing is uh, there's some um, questions about how you do verification, right? What is it you're actually verifying? It's pretty easy to verify a signature, but now we have some predicate on, oh, I expect the signature to be coming from, you know, William at gmail.com. I expect the signature to be coming from uh, GitHub with this repository. And, and so how do you express that in a way that's um, consistent across languages and across verifiers? And we're going to get um, kind of the, the, the same format. Um, and we have some fun ideas, I think, uh, and uh, I'll plug the, I'll drop a link in the chat, but the SIG clients uh, repo um, has a link to meetings and Slack channels where we talk about things, uh, things like that. Cool. Yeah, no, thanks for that. I think just, yeah, well, it sounds like it's all headed in the right direction, just, uh, yeah. Wanted to make sure I hadn't hadn't missed anything or new developments, but yeah, very cool. Yeah, um, what, one thing I'll also say is that one of the hopes that I have is that some of the work we're doing on this client will also be a forcing function for Python to reevaluate its support contract. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll see if it if it, it meets that that yeah. clears that bar, but I would like it if if they reevaluated the importance of supporting SunOS for given you know whatever. Nice. Hey, any other questions or discussion points? Okay, hearing none, we're going to wrap up. And uh, yeah, thanks very much, everybody, for attending. Next meeting next week is the SIG Stock community meeting. Uh, more focused on uh, contributors, uh, but do feel free to join us then. All right, thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. Yeah.